Okay, so I was excited about this session because um, it, it seems timely. There's been these great posters and lightning rounds throughout um, the week, so I'm so grateful to the session conveners for pulling this together. Um, and I think the topics are really um, interesting and challenging. Things like um, modeling brine behavior, chaotropicity, preservation of biomarkers. I mean, we have some great talks in this session that I'm looking forward to hearing. I'm going to try to touch on microbial ecology of <clears throat> this subglacial brine I'm going to tell you about, and also a little bit about how we're working to detect um, biosignatures. I'd like to invite everybody to stick around um, for the discussion session. It looks like we have one at 11, as well as at 11, uh, 3.15 here in this room, so we can have a more open discussion about some of these topics. OK, so the aim of my talk first is to introduce you to a subglacial brine ecosystem that I've been studying for some years now and describe some of its analog attributes. It's known as Blood Falls. It's located in the McMurdo Dry Valleys region of Antarctica, which is the largest ice-free region of the continent. Um, it's found within the Taylor Valley of this McMurdo Dry Valley complex, and it's at the terminus of the Taylor Glacier, which is an outlet glacier of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. And it's, it's quite a visceral feature. You can see it. Ooh, I have a little. You can see it right down there. OK. And so the sub-aims of my talk are to provide you with a discussion of some new insights into the physical structure of this ecosystem that we've been able to elucidate in order to inform what this microbial niche might be like, since we, for a long time, just have been collecting samples at the surface, so just scratching at the surface. Um, and this type of survey can also help inform sampling strategies. I'm going to talk about some consequences, right? When subsurface brine is discharged to a surface, um, there's going to be some changes. And so we've started to look at what's happening with this brine when it hits the surface. I'm going to share some um, musings on how we might be detecting biosignatures at this site. Um, and uh, by special request, I was going to do a little Don Juan Pan teaser um, to fill up some of the time. Oops. OK. Alrighty. So this is a distinct subglacial feature, as I mentioned. Um, and I don't know if you can hear that. Can you guys hear that rustling? So that's actually discharge of blood falls coming out. And it pours out over the surface here. And you can see it starts to work its way down this um, terminal moraine. And it'll leave some precipitates along the side. And this is something that I call active discharge. And so if you're able to hike up the glacier, and I don't know, it'll turn around a little bit. You can see I'm pretty high up on this mound. Um, I don't know if there's a. I'm probably at about up here, and you can turn around and see. If you can collect this discharge um, when it's first coming out, um, you'll find that it's a very um, salty brine. It's about two to three times the salinity of seawater. It's calcium chloride dominated. It's reducing, so there's no detectable oxygen. It has um, kind of a suboxic EH value of about 80 to 90 millivolts. It's circumneutral, and it's cold. It's between minus 5 and minus 7 degrees Celsius, um, and it contains iron. And through extensive research or extensive studies by my colleague Barry Lyons over the years and trying to pull out this active discharge composition, it appears to be that this is a concentrated seawater um, based on the ionic composition with some contributions of some weathering products over time. Um, there's also biology in this brine when you collect this active discharge. I can run this again if you're interested. Um, so it contains um, detectable cells, about one to the five cells per mil. That's about two orders of magnitude higher than the surrounding um, glacial ice. There's measurable metabolic activity, so you can feed labeled substrates to this water. And over time, um, it'll be incorporated into cellular biomass. You can cultivate some members of this community um, in the lab, and they're represented in clone libraries as well, or amplicon libraries. And they seem to have um, lifestyles related to organisms with iron and sulfur metabolisms. There's also multiple lines of evidence that this system is chemosynthetic, so that um, its uh, uptake of bicarbonate um, is enough to provide an, um, sufficient fixed carbon to the heterotrophic community. And there's multiple lines of evidence of this. So it seems like we're dealing with some type of metabolically active, chemosynthetic, briny, subsurface discharge um, at the terminus of the Taylor Glacier. Um, I hope I can convince you that there's some analog-like attributes of this system. And while there's no perfect analog, um, and throughout this week, we've heard talks about saturated groundwater sediments on Mars, potential for subglacial lakes on Mars. And today, we heard some great talks on Europa. And while we may or may not be able to get into the subsurface ocean in the near term, there's a lot of interesting features potentially happening in these ice covers. And so if brine is working its way through and being stored um, in this ice shell. And so Blood Falls provides a system that um, is sourced throughout this talk. I'll explain how it's sourced from deep groundwater within permafrost, so it can teach us lessons about that. 
It's a cold brine um, below a glacier that hosts a microbial community. Um, it can teach us a little bit about what happens to end glacial brine when it's stored within a conduit within ice for some period of time. And we can also learn about how um, discharge uh, changes the microbial biosignatures. OK, so um, the first aim was to talk about some of the new insights from um, physical structure we can learn from this ecosystem. And so for a long time, I wondered, I was always sampling at the surface, and I wondered um, what was the source to this feature, right? It was clearly different than the surrounding glacial ice and the melt that was occurring. So is it some type of subglacial lake on one hand, or on the other extreme, is it a sabka or some other salt deposit that's slowly redissolving under the glacier and creating this fluid? Um, and to put it in, this is, this is important because it can help us understand what controls the microbial community, right? Hydrology imparts strong controls. It can help describe the microbial niche, very different lifestyle if you're in a lake versus if you're in a salt deposit um, or something in between. And it can also teach us something about the potential ecological history, like where this system is on its trajectory from its origin. And I was inspired by some of the um, oceans across space and time um, themes where, you know, perhaps if it's a subglacial lake, it's a more contemporary system. Um, if it's this salt flat, it's perhaps a remnant system. And what if it's something in between, like a relic system, some remains of this um, previous contemporary system? Um, you can also think of it as on the continuum of um, uh, inhabited or uninhabited um, realm or somewhere in between that we've heard in some of the talks this week. OK. So how do we determine the physical structure of the system? Being in a narrow walled valley, radar was not super informative for describing the structure. And so we collaborated with a geophysics group out of Aarhus in Denmark. And they have a transient electromagnetic system that they're able to sling from a helicopter. It's called SkyTem. And what it does is it maps resistivity. So this, this is a brine that's about two and a half times the salinity of seawater. It's a strong conductor. And it would be a great candidate for this technique because we believe it's under a highly resistive glacier. And so SkyTem is a tool that you can sling from a helicopter so you can cover much larger areas of terrain than you could um, by typical ground-based DC resistivity methods. Um, it can penetrate to about 350 meters. And what it does is it tells you something about the geological material that these electromagnetic signals are interacting with. So this was actually highly productive in the dry valleys, and it elucidated a lot more brines than we were expecting to see. Um, but what I'm showing you here is a 3D image of the brine detected below the Taylor Glacier. Um, and so you can see here um, is the glacier. This is the profile line. Um, and then we did some cross sections. And this is the resistivity data. It's a diffusive method, so it's, it's a cross between 5 and 10 meters. The bright purple is highly resistive. The blue is very cool or conductive material. And so you can remove all the resistive stuff, which is the glacier, and you can see this um, morphology of this um, brine uh, anomaly, if you will, uh, below the glacier. And so this extensive network of these saturated sediments, um, it's estimated to be about 1 point, or 0.18 kilometers cubed which um, of groundwater, if you do some conservative estimates of the porosity of this sediment. Um, and that's pretty um, extensive. Here's um, the location of Blood Falls. And there's all these surface lakes some folks might be familiar with, and that's more volume than all these lakes combined. Um, it allows us to think of this microbial niche now as a groundwater aquifer system and what that might mean for the community with all this um, more rock water interaction time. Um, and it can also allow us to make estimates of um, if this microbial community is active, what the flux of nutrients might be um, coming out of the system. Um, and it can also inform us about this larger system that we don't have access to, um, this extensive brine network that we see um, throughout the Dry Valley. So I was pretty psyched about that. Um, so here's my Don Juan Pond teaser, um, because I think this type of modeling can be applied to other elusive brines. For example, um, Don Juan Pond, which is found in the Wright Valley. It's right adjacent here to where Blood Falls is located. Don Juan Pond is pretty otherworldly, um, and just a few details on it. There hasn't been a ton of work done on it since the DVD pro P project, the Dry Valley Drilling Project. It's highly saline. Um, it's thought to be the second most saltiest body on our planet. Um, it's a calcium chloride dominated brine. It's also nitrate rich. It's intermittent, so it's this ephemeral feature that is driven a lot by evaporation and then recharged by um, processes of either surface flow or possibly uh, groundwater. And to date, there has been no confirmed in situ life. Spoiler alert, I have no data on life detected in there. I'm uh, just going to talk to you about um, how we might better understand what to look for um, by better understanding the structure of that ecosystem. 
So here's an old figure from Harrison Cartwright. These guys were the leaders during the Dry Valley Drilling Project. And they discussed uh, the contribution of potential water tracks, bringing either fresh water or salts that were dragged with these water tracks from the surrounding valley to contribute to the salt balance of um, Don Juan Pond. Jay Dixon and colleagues have done a lot of work since that time. I also saw a great poster by Lynn and Toner here looking at some of the hydrologic flux. So it's still a really fascinating feature. Um, there's also been some work done thinking about whether or not there's a subsurface aquifer that's actually feeding this brine like an artesian well. Um, there was some water discovered in a 75 meter deep um, borehole drill during the DVDP project. And so um, this is a tool or uh, application of this tool that might help us um, reveal what is below. And this is just some preliminary data from our SkyTem survey um, this past November. So here are the lines we flew. This is about three and a half kilometers. And I'm going to take you through 20 meter depth slices. And you can see here is the resistive terrain around Don Juan Pond that I have circled here. And you can see this shines up in that cool, um, really conductive um, color versus the highly resistive permafrost that surrounds it. So down 20 to 40 meters, you can still see this brine. That's, that to me was pretty amazing that this is the, the brine at the top, the pond, is 30 centimeters. And so going down this deep suggests there's at least very salty, potentially saturated sediments some 40 meters below. This is down to 60 meters. This is down to 80, um, down to 100, starting to di disappear. Um, so in conclusion, on the Don Juan Pond bit, I'd say there's evidence for a finite confined aquifer. It's not necessarily all that extensive, but it's, um, it's there. Um, Don Juan Pond is a dynamic feature where evaporation seems to dominate. You do have evidence for recharge over these um, uh, water track-like features, as well as this feature right here that you can't see that well is a, a rock glacier that contributes some fresh water. And there also is um, groundwater that could be um, recharging the system as well. Um, what does this knowledge do when we think about the ecology of this feature? Are you interested in what accumulates in this pond at the surface, or are you more interested in the subsurface brine that feeds it, or the communities in the water track? So it's one way to maybe frame your research questions. And it got me thinking, is this uh, relic feature on its way to being remnant? Is it habitable but uninhabitable, or is it uninhabited? So, but back to Blood Falls. Because um, Blood Falls is sourced by a much um, more extensive aquifer. Right, so you have all of this below. This is about five kilometers up from the terminus of the glacier. Um, and this is where our sensor probably um, dropped out over about 350 meters of glacial ice. And so with this new insight, we can say something that, like, I think this is probably somewhere along the line of relic and that you have these saturated um, sediments and that what we're looking at here is an aquifer. You would expect um, extensive um, rock water interactions, et cetera. Um, and the microbial niche um, seems to reflect this physical setting. So what we find when we do sequencing, um, and this is uh, amplicon sequencing here, um, we find some phylotypes that are similar to groundwater, marine sediments, and other deep subsurface environments. We do not find chloroplasts. We do not find eukaryotes. Um, doesn't mean they're not there, but we have not been able to detect them by our methods. Um, and we find uh, organisms that are chemosynthetic and actively involved in iron and sulfur cycling. So it seems to make sense, the ecology that we're seeing with what we think this feature is now like. We also have chemical evidence for extended rock water interactions, including um, really high silica concentrations, as well as a radiogenic strontium signature. Um, but surface collection is really unpredictable. Um, so this is chloride concentration here on the y-axis, and these are just discrete dates. This is not a continuum of sampling. This is a challenging place to get to. And so, you know, you have moments of high chloride concentration and a lot of moments of, you know, low times, which were the majority of um, the time that I'm down there. Um, and so many of the samples are collected during these um, really low salinity times. And you can see here, I'm looking disappointed. There's not a lot of stuff coming out of Blood Falls. And this would be a year that I would say there's non-discharge. There's just um, surface melt happening, if you see anything that looks like flow. Um, versus those active discharge events like I showed you in that video. Um, and there were two years that I obtained some of this active discharge that I'm going to talk about um, here. And you can see there's a, a visible manifestation of having some discharge at the surface. And so the sneaky little feature, what's it doing? There was often seasons that I would come back and it was clear that something happened. I mean, how do you go from this uh, somewhat frowny face um, front to 
I mean, this like amazing um, uh, feature here. And so we set, we decided to spy on blood falls over the winter. And so we put up some um, cameras over the winter. There's time when this starts to black out. I should probably have to set this up better and run it again. But I don't know if you can see here some discharge happening while it's dark. So this is in the um, austral winter. And so this is around May that you're starting to see um, this discharge event. Let's see if I can run this again because it's really dark up on the screen that you guys see here. Whoops, or not. Okay. So you can see here, right around May, you start to have a little bit of squirt, squirt, uh, more squirts, right? So it's coming out, and then when you arrive in November. So clearly there was a discharge event um, in the winter prior to us arriving in November. Okay, so since the surface is unpredictable and when you can plan your trips to this feature, you kind of have to go with what you get at the time, our goal was to see if we could obtain a more pristine sample by actually drilling into the glacier. And so for that, we employed a collaboration with a German engineering group um, called uh, the ICEMOL. It was their NX or Enceladus Explorer project, and they were funded by um, the DLR. Um, we had a fantastic collaboration with them. This is a thermomechanical drill. It was designed um, to melt and also um, turn in the ice. What we liked about it as microbiologists is we could practice our cleaning techniques in the field. So here we are in our Tyvex cleaning it prior to deployment. In addition to planetary protection-like protocols, we also have a code of conduct for um, dipping into pristine subglacial environments as part of the Antarctic Treaty. Okay, so how did we know where to go? Well, um, here's a cart our cartoon schematic of what we think is happening at the interface between um, the subglacial aquifer and this uh, little crevasse where blood falls discharges. It appears to be this weak spot that the brine tends to move its way out of. So you have this pressurized brine that's working its way through. It causes basal, oops, sorry, basal crevassing at the base of the glacier. And then this opens up and initiates um, subglacial discharge. And so while we weren't able to go deep enough into the um, subglacial aquifer, we wanted to try to get into this conduit here to see if this was representative of what was deeper in the glacier. And so we used some temperature measurements, right? This is the uh, mean annual temperature of the glacier around minus 15, minus 17. And so this brine is actually a thermal anomaly, right? At minus five, minus seven, it's a warm fluid moving through this colder ice. And so we can model where we expect to first hit this brine at about 17 meters. So that is where we drilled down to. And as we drilled through, we found that um, conductivity at about 11 meters really started to increase. So it looked like you had a lot of refreezing on of this brine from um, historic um, movements throughout the conduits. So you have layers of brine as this material is refreezing, maybe even a new layer from this discharge event in um, the spring. Um, and then we were able to uh, tap into this little brine pocket where it's actually still liquid. Um, and I'm not going to go over uh, details of the geochemistry there. For the most part, um, it was very similar geochemically to the active discharge we get. It was um, slightly more concentrated. So I do think there was some um, freeze concentration that occurred um, over those few months. But I will show you some of the sequence data that we have. And I know this is a busy figure, so I'm just going to try to highlight um, uh, some of the data here. This is our Illumina MySeq Amplicon uh, data, looking at relative abundance of the different phylotypes that we see in our various samples from a brine and around the glacier. So um, when we look at samples that come from this conduit or from active discharge events, like that video I showed you, what we see here um, is very consistent um, abundances and diversity in these samples. So these would be these high um, salt samples that we have. Um, and so the conclusion there is that this end glacial brine and the active discharge appear to be stable, even though they were sampled over a decade apart. And so this is, I think, kind of interesting it's like the second sub, or the first subglacial feature to be sampled twice, and we're seeing um, the same relative abundance. Um, and we were able to pick out from this limited data set what we consider a core microbiome. So of these samples, um, there were 66 OTUs that were common between them that made up 92% of the data. Um, Moving on to the surface events, so this is during those frowny years when it's a little bit, well, it's not frowny, it's fine. It's just, it's, it's different. Um, so it's, I, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm warming up to it. So um, the, the salt content is very low. You're collecting samples from the surface and you can see they're, they're really different from what we, what we see in the um, end glacial brine. And these are, there's high variation between samples collected and they're dominated by chloroplasts. Um, we can use some bioinformatic techniques. This was work led by my postdoc, Richard Campin. His paper has just come out. Um, but here he was using these taxonomic biomarkers to identify 
um, different differentially abundant taxa using a program called LEAFSEE. Um, and some of the biomarkers we found that are indicative, so if you get a sample and you're like, oh, is this brine or not, you'd want to look for these organisms. First, you'd want to see there's no chloroplasts in there, but then you would also look for some of these organisms, such as the Atrobacter. This is a um, Bacteroides that has only 86% 80, sequence identity um, to an organism from a marine saltern. And our first identification of um, archaea, the Pacey archaeota group, um, are present in this sample. Um, yeah, so there's the, it seems through um, sequence diversity, you can differentiate between um, these two samples, which is kind of cool. Okay. But now the brine is out on the surface, um, and how does this change? We see this strong community shift, and it makes me think of ocean worlds and what you might get on the surface and how different what we're seeing at this um, really beautiful surface feature is from where it actually sourced from. Okay, so when if we go back and look at this discharge, if I were to follow it down the glacier and start sampling, I'd start with something that had no detectable oxygen. I'd move on to something that had um, increasing levels of oxygen as you go down the glacier terminus. Um, this year we stuck a CO2 flux sensor out there, and you can see you're also um, degassing a lot of CO2 from the system. And this is a really traumatic event for a microorganism. You're increasing in pH. <laughs> You're getting exposed to sunlight after you've potentially been under a glacier for millions of years. Um, your oxygen, which is a stressor, pressure changes, you're getting diluted. So whatever it was that you became comfortable with in this like incredibly stable, mellow, dark environment, it's now like, so um, this can be traumatic. All right, so this is where I move into the last step, talking about how we might use this um, surface stuff we collect as a biosignature. And I think this is an evolving understanding. I'm finding myself even um, in part, ooh, okay, I'll just breeze through this. Um, one, you know, we, we first looked at Mars, we saw a face on Mars. Um, now we can do some really advanced spectroscopy and actually, so the same thing happens down there at Blood Falls. When you first saw it, the first explorers, heroic though they were, they thought this was snow algae at the surface. Um, later in the 60s, during the determined age, um, they did some analysis and found there was halite, aragonite, et cetera. So they were starting to do some of the mineralogy, um, but weren't necessarily sure of the biology. So for our future directions, we'd like to characterize this a bit more. I've collaborated with Darby Dyer and Eli Skolt at Planetary Science Institute and Petey Lee to look at some of the volatile spectra that will be coming out of this feature, as well as some of the mineralogy of the surface. I got one minute. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, so there is some hope in this diversity data. So in the conduit sample, which is this last one right here, you see there is some shift in abundance. Um, and one of them in particular was this thiomicrospira, which is a chemosynthetic sulfur oxidizer, um, was six times higher in the conduit sample. Again, you'd need replicates to think anything about it, but maybe there's some community shifts that we can predict in the conduit. Um, there also seems to be some remnants that might be left at the surface. We had one non-outflow sample that I hiked up high um, to get, and it had some of the core brine members, but they were poorly represented, and it didn't have some of those indicator microbes, but there were still um, some of the dominant features in there. So perhaps there's some remnants that we can um, pick up. Um, in the essence of time, I won't go through this except just to say that we've been collecting samples, collecting cultures from the surface, and we're using um, some of these techni techniques such as ramen and FTIR to look at the mineral composition of both the surface and pure cult cultures to see if we can validate what we see using various electron donor minerals as well as um, use it looking at different stages of the growth phase because I think that's important as well as various temperatures. So in conclusion, um, physical structure of these systems can tell us about ecosystem status. Um, it can help inform what um, the ecology might be. It can be a good target um, looking at, uh, sorry, we were able to deduce a, brine, a core microbiome. Um, the discharge is dramatically dramatic and rapidly shifts, but there may be some little remnants in this discharge that we can tease out. And some fodder for discussion. I'm inspired to see so many talks on cold organisms. I'm especially looking forward to some of them in this, this session. Is it the golden age? These were always underrepresented in culture collections and not as abundant in our um, genome libraries, but um, I've really seen a change in that over the time, and I'm so excited because these are fabulous organisms. Look at this guy. Oh my goodness, this is a Shuanella collected from the surface of Blood Falls. Membrane vesicles, oh my, this is lovely. And then this little EPS in this tail, I mean, he's. It's really attractive, um, but if you were to look in its, it really is, but if you were to look in its genome, you would see things like it has the ability 
um, to uh, bind to ice, and so it has these different adhesion properties. How is this going to affect mineral precipitation in an ice environment as opposed to in some other type of environment? Um, so with that, I'd like to thank um, my fantastic lab group. Um, I, this obviously wouldn't be worth it without them, um, as well as our um, funding agencies that help support us and all my um, amazing collaborators. Um, it's a frost flower. Um, that's the only type of ice we tend to get in Tennessee. Okay, thank you. This is working, yeah. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, if someone could come up to the microphone rather than shouting from your seat, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh -oh. Come on up. <laughs> no, no, I'm <I'm> scared. <laughs> uh, you made this nice teaser about the Don Juan pond, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, with the modeling and uh, you know remote sensing of that, I mean, you know, if you do astrobiology, you have to get close and personal, right? Yeah. So uh, when you swing by blood forts, can you also swing by at the Don Juan Pond and get samples there? Or? So we did this season, yeah. And maybe I should have teased a little more um, than I did. But so the, this was just the survey, but we also collected some samples. And so we can do a little more work. My, I guess what I was trying to set up is that it's going to be hard to tease out what is in situ versus what may have been blown in or what may have been dragged in along the permafrost boundary. And so I think um, these complicated biosignatures, like pulling out what is contamination versus what is truly subsurface brine, I'm an advocate of finding a way to drill again, much like they did in the Dry Valley Drilling Project. If we really want to know what uncontaminated um, features are. Okay. So, but yeah, we'll... Okay. We should still talk about the Don Juan point. Yes, definitely. <laughs> It's really hot right now. Hi, Hi. Uh, um, I'm Zach Cooper from the University of Washington. I, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, microbial activity in the subglacial brines and what you think about uh, like growth rates based on the uh, you know like subzero hypersaline anoxic conditions and like what the carbon utilization and residence times of these communities might look like. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's probably really slow and we've incubated these at non in situ temperatures so like 0 degrees is the best we can do in the field and you have really slow rates some of our turnover times for certain substrates are 300 days some are even higher. So, I mean, these are really slow growing systems and these may not be the best measurements, like giving them a labeled substrate is probably not the way to go. And so that's one of our challenges as people who study cold systems is how can you better track turnover time? And I don't know if in your group you're doing some cool new methods to look at that, but. Thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, that's really good. I'd like to like talk to you a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And I also think that that's why we've switched a little bit to laboratory cultures that you can, they're not necessarily growing optimally. They might be growing faster at these higher temperatures, but you can, it's a starting point to help you pinpoint what to look for when you're doing these really challenging long-term in situ experiments. Yeah. Cool. yeah, thanks. Thank you. Just a really quick question. Oh, uh, I was just going to draw your attention. You may have seen there was a talk earlier this week showing you can measure biomass in subsurface waters with polar metric resistivity measurements. Is that the uh, seismic? Biogeophysics talk is... I don't know. It may be something that you're sort Absolutely. Of exploring. Um, what, do you know what type of technique they were using? Was it no, size? Because I, I was talking to somebody who was doing, doing sonar or something they were using. Anyway, if anyone has any information on that, I think that uh, would There's be a paper, I think, if you said. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Thank you for your Great. attention. Everyone could thank Jill McCookie again, please. Thank you.